Survival horror as a genre is one that has always meant a lot to me. If you've followed my channel, you know that some of my all-time favorite games fall into that category in at least some form or fashion. It is a genre that has fallen out of favor in the general public since its inception, essentially being buried underneath the entire seventh generation of consoles and its hive mind thought that AAA devs had where every game had to lean towards making a game for everyone. I think this mainly spawned from the success of Call of Duty 4, and while I don't dislike that game, I really do think that it was a huge turning point for that entire console generation. It sold so well because it was such an accessible game, and was incredibly polished and played really well. Plus, the game's graphics at the time were so good that even Adam- I almost said Adam Sandler. <laughs> even Adam Sessler opened his review on X-Play saying that he couldn't believe how good the game looked. These factors help give Modern Warfare the needed momentum to becoming that well-received and that influential. And that's not even touching the game's now hugely popular multiplayer mode, which is now what the franchise has become known for in the pop culture zeitgeist. Dead Space and Fear couldn't last three games in their own franchise before becoming a co-op hallway shooter that stuck to its roots by occasionally having like a spooky jump scare here and there. And Resident Evil became this. Yes! Yes! <laughs> and this problem wasn't only limited to horror games at the time. The same sort of thing happened to varying degrees to games like Mass Effect, Dragon Age, and I'd even be willing to argue Paper Mario suffered that same sort of fate with the removal of the entire RPG system and mechanics from the Wii era onward. And this also goes as far as so many games trying to shove online components where it doesn't belong. Games like the aforementioned Dead Space and Fear games, Bioshock 2 of all things, and The Last of Us were all trying to catch that cash cow of accessible beef that Call of Duty was raking in during that time, and at least from where I was standing in the landscape of video games looking at the AAA slaughterhouse that was before me, it was pretty disheartening. But after many years of thinking that gaming as a medium was going to oversaturate itself with this one-track mine of development, out came Resident Evil 7. Now, I don't think Resident Evil 7 was perfect, far from it, but it was definitely a step in the direction that I think the current gen Resident Evil games should be taking. It was genuinely creepy at points, had a decent item management system, and its atmosphere was pretty solid all around. There were things about it that I didn't like and still don't think were all that great, but I think an argument that I put forward in a now real old video of mine that you can put down to me just being a boomer is that the game paled in comparison in nearly every single regard to the Resident Evil remake. It did retain some of the classic elements of the survival horror that made the franchise tick at one point, but I think the biggest thing that was missing was the feeling of being lost. The feeling of really looking at the map and making a strategy, a plan, thinking of what enemies were on the path, how much stuff you could realistically bring with you, and realizing that with carrying the HP you'll need, the ammo, the gun, the potential backup gun because you have such little ammo for the first gun, backup ammo, and the key you need to open up the next section of the game. My biggest problem with this essentially is just that Resident Evil 7, and even more so Village, felt really linear, very narrow in scope and design whereas the older Resident Evil games felt like a Metroidvania. The Resident Evil 2 remake had that, and my god, is it glorious. In my opinion, as far as the AAA current horror landscape is concerned, the Resident Evil 2 remake is the single best use of the old-school survival horror tenants that the franchise itself started. There were multiple instances where I had that aforementioned anxiety of planning a route, trying to act on that plan, and failing miserably, only to realize then and there that I hadn't saved and just lost about two hours of progress. Is Resident Evil 2 the best in the series? No. Is it the best in the series since the Resident Evil remake? Yeah. Probably. But after Resident Evil 7, which was a decent gamble for Capcom, and in hindsight is pretty insane to think about, AAA games, and I guess more specifically, AA studios and devs, were willing to take bigger chances on horror titles due to the backing of not only the success of Resident Evil 7, but also the indie horror scene that had been burgeoning since the release of games like Slender and Amnesia The Dark Descent. 
Most horror games nowadays, at least in the indie scene, are interesting little bite-sized games that take an interesting concept or an idea and warp it into something horrifying. Games like Mother put you in the shoes of a mom of two little shits and needed to protect them from a monster. No One Lives Under the Lighthouse puts you in the shoes of a lighthouse keeper and you have to deal with some legitimate otherworldly shenanigans. A game I just recently covered on 12 Days of Itchy Tasty called Lidar is one of the best examples of playable tension as the game shows you nothing until you scan it, leaving the entire universe of possibilities always right in front of your face. But AAA, or mainstream horror I guess as I'll call it from here on out, tends to lean towards a more action approach. But a lot of the more recent games have actually succeeded in giving us what we want. Or at least what I expect more mainstream horror to give. The Resident Evil series, while I don't agree with some or even potentially a lot of the decisions made in Village, as a series it's arguably doing better than it ever has before. The Evil Within 2, while I'm really not a big fan of it, was a mainstream hit with its small little open world, its bombastic set pieces, and its generally creepy tone. And games like Scorn, despite some drawbacks, does return to a much more survival type of horror, and was the first horror game in a while that stumped me with puzzles. These were and are signs that classic survival horror can actually come back and find an audience. Cut to a few months ago, while all the hype was building around the upcoming release of Scorn, which had finally gotten a real release date after, like, eight years, I'm browsing Xbox Game Pass and I see this little game called Signalus on the upcoming games page. I think the art style is interesting, and the very stark image advertising the game really catches my eye, so I do some investigating and I see that it is advertised as a classic survival horror experience set in a dystopian future where humanity has uncovered a dark secret. I look at the screenshots and I'm honestly kind of chuckling to myself because I think there's no way that a game that looks like this could possibly replicate a true survival horror experience. I assume that the game would wear the genre as a mask and use elements of it, but I mean, look at it. How could a game like this possibly recreate the feeling of playing Resident Evil? Let me get this out of the way immediately. Signalus is, without a doubt, a true return to survival horror. It is a game that is focused entirely on revitalizing what made the genre so popular so many years ago. It utilizes a huge puzzle box design, albeit slightly tweaked with a modern design philosophy, a limited inventory and excellent item management system, durable zombie type enemies, and more disturbing otherworldly type creatures as well. And it's all topped off with an incredible soundtrack. And I think that it is, without a doubt, the single best survival horror game since the Resident Evil remake on the GameCube. The game opens up with your character, a replica named Elster, waking up from a stasis sleep on a crashed wreckage of a ship stranded on an icy remote planet. For those unaware, replicas in this game are essentially a slightly less invisible version of the replicants from Blade Runner. The prologue has you uncover vague clues about the ship that you're on, the most curious of which is a damaged photo showing a white-haired woman. This photo serves multiple purposes as it not only provides your first real glimpse into the game's puzzles, as you have to turn the photo around in your inspect menu to actually see a hidden code on the back of the photograph, but it is also your first real moment of intrigue that the game gives you, as Signalist tells you that it is someone named Ariane Young. As you solve the initial puzzles of the game and step outside, you wander around the frostbitten wasteland and stumble upon a series of pillars and eventually find an ominous hole in the middle of the storm. Upon entering this strange location, you find another hole up against the wall that leads you into a strange room at the end of a long tunnel. This place shows signs of a room lived in, but nobody here to claim it as their own. There's a shelf of books, a safe, a desk with a computer and a radio that appears to be non-functional. The hole that you entered through is missing and the door has no handle to escape from, but there is a beam of red light shining through the holes where the handles should be. Upon picking up a book titled The King in Yellow, the radio begins to blare the now famous three-note oddity. 
blasting a cycle of numbers at you as snippets of poetry begin to flash onto the screen. Elster begins to melt away as she continues to stare into the numbers. A rotation of images that you don't yet understand flicker before you, and a game cuts to the title card. But not before showing you the line, Remember Our Promise. This is one of the most interesting and genuinely intriguing cold opens to any piece of media that I've encountered, let alone one in a video game. It invokes a sense of real curiosity, unlike many can manage, and yet it doesn't steer you wrong in any way. When the intro finally stops and it cuts to the game proper, and you find yourself on the Sierpinski facility, you may not even realize that the game is already fucking with you in more ways than one. But as you wander around the facility, you find other replicas that have managed to stave off this surreal nightmare that seems to be contaminating everything, both living and robotic, throughout the Sierpinski facility. As you push further into the game, you discover things about each replica design, their unique attributes, their pre-programmed faults, and their reason for being here. But you, as Elster, have one mission. Find Alina So. Signalis's gameplay is cemented firmly in the survival horror tendencies, but unlike a lot of games that try to replicate the feeling of the genre and its pillars, so to say, of game design, Signalis somehow manages to firmly sit somewhere in the perfect sweet spot of homaging and establishing its own rules, setting, themes, and story. A majority of Signalis's runtime plays like a near-identical, but slightly evolved and modern version of the Resident Evil remake. Progressing in Signalis requires you to solve puzzles, kill monsters, conserve ammo, manage your inventory, as well as being forced to save exclusively at save stations. Ammo being as scarce as it is, is one of the driving forces behind the game, as you are constantly put into rooms that house multiple enemies, and until you've gotten a good hang of the game's controls, you will most often find yourself expending ammo that you can't really afford to waste hoping that the next bullet in the chamber will put the monster down because there is another enemy right behind it, inching its way towards you. But just like its brother, Resident Evil, once you've put a chunk of time into Signalis, you'll find that with just the right amount of precise and careful finesse, you can actually avoid a lot of the fights in the game, or at least barely scrape by them by running for your life, barreling towards the nearest door. But what Signalis does add to the formula is actually something really daring and honestly pretty bold of the devs to do. The gameplay loop here is mostly focused on item management, as Elster is only allowed six item spaces in her inventory, very much like Chris Redfield from the original Resident Evil. And just like that game, you are constantly put in scenarios where you are making difficult decisions on how to trek forward with your inventory. Do you bring more ammo? More healing? How will you fit the fuse that you need to activate the elevator? Do you keep the flashlight or sacrifice a weapon altogether and hope that you can outmaneuver the enemies? The thing that Signalis does to spice up this formula is not streamline the inventory system, but actually make it more restrictive, more punishing, and honestly much more cruel than Resident Evil before it. There is even an in-universe reason for Elster only having six slots in her inventory. Right at the beginning of the game, you see a propaganda poster that demands the workers of the Sierpinski facility to never carry more than six items on their person. And with Elster essentially being a bioengineered android, it makes sense that she never breaks free from her assigned programming, even during this nightmare that she's experiencing. In the Resident Evil remake, you are allowed a few items that are outside of your inventory. Sub-weapons like the knife, the taser, and flashbang grenades, as well as character-specific inventory items, are items that you can essentially have an infinite amount of if given the opportunity, as they essentially go into a separate item list. I like to think of it as all of the items that your character holds in their inventory to be stuff that they can fit in their pockets, or on their back, etc. While the sub-weapons and sub-items are things that fit right alongside their belt buckle. In Signalis, however, there is no such leeway. If you want to carry a sub-weapon that insta-KOs an enemy, you're gonna have to give up an item slot. If you want to carry a flare that prevents the enemies from resurrecting on a trip back to the same area, you have to give up a precious item space luxury. Even around the midway point of the game when you're given a flashlight, 
That's another item slot that you have to sacrifice if you want to progress throughout specific rooms of the game that are caked in darkness and are inexplorable otherwise. And given that you only have 6 inventory slots, it's not uncommon for a majority of the time, you're essentially really only stuck with 4 or 5 slots to work with. It's not uncommon for a game, let alone a modern one, to use an already punishing mechanic and make it even more punishing. While this may sound derivative, as you can argue there is very little innovation happening here from the established Resident Evil formula, I would argue that isn't a bad thing because the two-person team behind Signalis did such a good job at replicating it in a way that made me grin from ear to ear pretty much the whole time I was playing it. It's been so long since I played a game that didn't try to hide its cards up its sleeve, but rather played its cards face up on the table and went all in on a pair of tens, which is essentially what the team behind the game has done here with Signalis. As far as puzzles go, I feel like I'm safe in saying, unless you're actively looking for a puzzle game, a lot of more modern games that utilize puzzles have been somewhat lacking in the use your brain category. There's a door just across this gap. Tear could be right there. Oh, the water's overflowing where you froze that trough. That's helpful. Maybe you can use those things. Like I said in the beginning of the video, Scorn, while somewhat of a letdown in a few aspects, was a wonderful return to form for puzzles being a focus in horror games. Each puzzle was at least somewhat of a brain teaser, and each one felt incredibly well thought out and well designed. Signalist, while not as consistently fantastic as a lot of Scorn's puzzles, does hit some really, really high highs, as well as returning to the tried and true formula of find item, use item, to blend and loosen up the mixture of the delicious little brain juice concoction that the game backs its puzzles with. There are many notable highlights, like the puzzle where you have to navigate a library system in order to get a specific book, a puzzle where you have to do actual math to get the right wattage to help power a strange dumbwaiter, a magnificent multiple layer puzzle where you have to find two separate discs to not only find a working radio tower, but also help find specific information of certain people in the station's history log that gives you a passcode for a specific room, and a puzzle where you have to use radio frequencies to uncover passcodes for safes throughout the facility. There are many more examples I can give, but the complex nature of some of these puzzles really brought back the feeling that wandering around the Spencer Mansion gave to me so many years ago. But Signalus has the thematic knife twist that this entire facility wasn't supposed to be presented in this puzzle box format. The Spencer Mansion always felt otherworldly due to its intentionally obtuse puzzles being like a gatekeep designed to keep the secret of the mansion hidden. But when you solve the puzzles in Signalis, it's because the entire facility is just falling apart. And in that sense, it has its own unique feeling of malevolence. And malevolence is now where I want to shift the topic to. Signalis and all of its resurrection of survival horror mechanics, mechanisms, and systems, while being so true to the gameplay of Resident Evil, dips its toes into another giant of the horror scene with Silent Hill, even taking the iconic Nowhere of the first game for its own. But while the aesthetics of Silent Hill's Nowhere are similar, there is something about Signalist that is more cruel, more sinister, and more tragic than even the titan of horror gaming that is Silent Hill 2. And its malevolence is built around cycles. There is a painting that you see in Signalis. It's a real painting, and it's titled Isle of the Dead. And it becomes a motif as the game reaches its climax. There is an ominous feeling that you get from staring at this painting. Not only as Elster, but you. You can't quite put your finger on it, but you feel like you've seen this painting before. Or maybe you saw this one. Or maybe it was this one. Or this one? These are paintings made by Swiss symbolist Arnold Bachlin. Prints of this painting were popular throughout Europe in the 20th century, even being claimed that they could be 
found in every Berlin home. There is a strange feeling that I get while looking at this painting. It feels warm, cold, welcoming, and distant. There is a beauty in its strange malevolence as the inner half-circle of the island looks like it's opening its arms to you as if to bring you into its center, greeting you with the promise of life from the green trees, but only promising death in the end. I don't know how to feel really while looking at the Isle of the Dead. I think I find serenity from it, but I also feel unease, and I'm not sure. My feelings seem to be going in everywhere in the game. There are images of circles. The King in Yellow has circular locks on its pages. You constantly read about an eye in the sky. There are so many puzzles in the game built around circles. The title menu of the game has a close-up of an eye. Signalis is about cycles. And it doesn't stop at visual imagery or story thematicism. It's even brought into the gameplay mechanics itself. There is a character that you meet named Adler. And he is the first person that you see in this game that hints at some supernatural malevolence. But even in his earliest encounters, he only appears to you as a villain. Someone going out of their way to hide the evils of the facility by pushing you down the shaft of an elevator. The first hint of the true meaning behind his character and the reality-shifting truth of the world of Signalis is shown to you as you wake up on a pile of corpses that completely fills four floors, catching your Elster unit and saving her life. Upon closer inspection, you realize that these aren't the other replicas that you've seen in the facility, but your exact model all stacked on top of each other in a macabre twist of fate that prevented you from becoming just another corpse among the pile. But how can all of these be here? You've seen and will see notes scattered in rooms claiming that an Elster model has no right or reason being on this facility. You are not scheduled, you are not assigned, and you do not belong on the Serpinski site. As you progress further still, repeating circles become all-encompassing, eventually culminating in the cutscene where the only human still left alive on the Serpinski facility stabs Adler directly in his eye, sending him falling down an ominous hole in a mine underneath the station. The word cycles followed by another image of a circle flashes on the screen, and you follow in Adler's footsteps later in the game by jumping down the same hole, only to land in a bizarre, otherworldly reality where the concepts of up, down, left, and right have all become meaningless. Down here where the world is falling apart, the aspects of Silent Hill and Signalis shine the brightest. TVs filter static red eyes through their concave screens, giving you the feeling of being watched by some evil that you can't quite comprehend. This truly is nowhere. Right becomes left, up becomes down going backwards to go forwards, almost like you're standing still, or maybe after you finally break free of the non-reality, you find yourself back outside of the facility as you were at the beginning of the game, but now there is no snow. There is only the bright red desert of death, discarded pillars, and discarded and forgotten Elster units. Adler appears before you, now begging you not to go any further. As he says, he has been here countless times, and it always ends the same. The picture of the girl that you took at the beginning of the game is different than what it was. The girl is brown-haired, not white. Two girls looking identical yet different. You may not have even realized it. Her name, Alina So, is similar, but different. Cycles are consuming the reality around you now, and yet you press on. You have a promise to keep. As Elster stumbles in the blood-red landscape, your body begins to flash between all of these different islands. Over and over again, you see different paintings of the same island, slightly different, consuming Elster as she finds the lost and destroyed ship from the beginning of the game. Different and infinite versions of the same person struggling to climb up the side of the ship, trying to fulfill a promise that not only you, but she probably can't even remember at this point. 
The paintings continue to cycle through Elster's body as she struggles to open the emergency hatch of the system, but she fails, her arm being torn off in the process as she tumbles down back to the ground where the life in her eye, close up to the screen, slowly fades away, losing all sign of life. And the game fades to black as the credits finally roll. Survival horror as a genre is one that has always meant a lot to me. If you followed my channel, you'd know that some of my all-time favorite games fall into that category in at least some form or fashion. It's a genre that has fallen out of favor in the general public since its inception, essentially being buried underneath the entire seventh console generation, and its hive mind thought that AAA devs had where every game had to lean towards making a game for everyone. But horror as a genre can tackle many things. I've talked about how I think horror as a medium is one of the best, most impactful, and most misunderstood genres around in my video on the movie Men that you can watch here. But in the form of video games, it can be something new altogether. Incorporating the reality of life itself into its mechanics or making the themes of the game become something that you not only experience, but something that you have to abide by. It can make the themes of the game something that you have to live through nearly as much as the characters on the screen. The rules of the game are rules that you can't break. You're bound to them. Constantly looping ad nauseum in a way that means when you run back to the same room you've been back to over and over trying to figure out where to use an item, or when you're struggling to figure out where to go, it is a cycle that you are bound to. Even when you succeed in a puzzle, you begin a new cycle of exploration, puzzle solving, ammo conservation, and panic saving. Signalus is a game about cycles. When you boot the game again and realize that now you're in a different location than you were at the real beginning of the game, or at least a different reality, maybe it's a different time. You aren't sure, but you've been here before, and it's different now. The girl that you've been looking for since the beginning of the game is here. She hugs you, you kiss, and you begin to dance only to cut back to the blood-red landscape. Ariane standing above you, wounds forming on her person, only to flash cut to the frozen landscape again, back to the start. But then you are back on the ship, now wrecked just like it was at the start of the game. At this point, you are beyond all comprehension. But when you walk into the room with the initial puzzle that the photo of Ariane helped you solve, there is a corpse here now. Another Elster unit. Back at the Serpinski station again. Back to the start. The flesh world of nowhere beginning to creep into the station itself, beyond the places where it was contained. Whatever the facility discovered in the mine is finally breaking free, and it is consuming not only the station, but the reality of the universe itself. However, for a moment, it seems like there is hope for you, and for Elser. You stumble upon an entirely new section of the facility, an atrium that leads to a mess of apartments and hospitals. Upon completing a puzzle that requires you to look into the dreams of someone long forgotten and piecing together different cycles of the moon, an ominous hole appears before your eyes. Just like before, you must crawl through it, and it brings you back to the start of the game again. The same room, the same shelf of books, the same radio, the same king in yellow. But this time, the door opens. As you walk down the final hallway of the game, you find notes from Ariane, from the commander of the Sierpinski station, the one who first wandered into the nightmarish world brought upon by the work done in the mine. And she talks about how her memories are merging with an Elster unit. Memories of dancing together with a white-haired woman she doesn't recognize. Falling prey to the exact emotions 
that your Elster unit felt towards Ariane. Two minds interlinking, but never becoming one. And then there is a note from Adler, telling you that you've been here before. you failed every time. Turn back, because there is nothing for you here. Signalis's greatest tragedy is that the players in its story don't even realize that they're doomed to live an eternity of suffering. Over and over again, they live to relive and relapse these tragic events played out to not only each other, but the player. How many times has Issa realized that she never existed aboard the facility? How many times has an Elster unit made it to this room to fight Falk and lose? You are the one in control of this never-ending cycle of trauma and abuse. It's characters living lives that don't exist due from the life lived by Arian Young. Someone who was abused from the society she lived in willingly left on a one-way trip through the cosmos with only an Elster unit by her side, only to become lost and unable to die. While recent games like Omori may have hit me harder, Signalis, just like Silent Hill 2 before it, will live on in all of our minds for a very long time. Because its narrative is so layered and so filled with unexplained aspects that you'll always come back to it whether by playing it again, or simply by analyzing it. You'll want to know more, and in order to do so, you will have to begin another cycle. It's questionable if the events of the game even unfolded in the first place, as if they're not some malevolent, dying flash of endorphins flooding in Ariane's brain that's melding with your Elster unit, before she finally gives in to the cold hand of death whisking her away to that island. But what is real is the game that you're playing and every single person in its story, its code, is forever trapped inside this tormenting cycle and its themes make even your countless deaths as you attempt to conquer its narrative part of its own story. You die and are reborn. Elster lives infinite lives infinite islands, and infinite final encounters with the commander of the Sierpinski. And even after all that, after Elster manages to finally make her way back to the only person in the whole universe she cares about and end her life to end the eternal suffering that she's going through, she collapses at her lover's side, exactly like you found her, and waits for you to hit begin one more time. Merry Christmas, everybody. I hope you enjoyed my surprise 12th day of Itchy Tasty with this big-ass video of Signalus. Um, <laughs> game's really good. I wrote all of this in one manic episode, <laughs> pretty much. So I hope it, it was what you wanted. <laughs> I'll see you next year. I'm going to take a break in January, but I'll be back in February making content, baby. Love your face. Love your show. Tomato is a fruit, but it's also a vegetable.